John chapter 14. And I want us to read the first six verses. Very familiar passage of Scripture. I'm sure all of us know it quite well. One of the more familiar passages of Scripture in the Word of God. It says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many bad. And were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And whither I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? And Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father, but by me. We've been in the Gospel of John for, this is the 28th message. And certainly this is a well that runs deep. There's a lot of truth to be discovered from this particular passage, or this particular book in the Bible, and no way we even remotely began to try to teach verse by verse with more or less selected themes, topics, all of which trying to stay in context with the central theme. That central theme is found in John chapter 20. We've read it many times in verse 31. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believe you might have life through his name. That's the central theme. That's why the book was written. That's why John goes to great length to record all that he re records in this particular book is to point men to the fact that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And that's been the major emphasis of every chapter. If you'll note, every chapter has some kind of emphasis that emphasizes the work of Jesus Christ. Just for example, chapter 11 emphasizes the fact that he is the resurrection and the life. Chapter 12, 12 emphasizes that Jesus Christ is the king. Chapter 13 emphasizes that Jesus Christ is the son. So here in John chapter 14, what does it emphasize? It emphasizes the fact that Jesus Christ is the mighty counsel or the great counsel. When you look at this book of the Gospel of John, this book is, is actually built upon seven very important pillars. The first pillar that you find when you start to study this book is the pillar of his incarnation. How important is the incarnation? If you don't have an incarnate Christ, you don't have a gospel. If you don't have an incarnate Christ, you don't have a salvation. If you don't have an incarnate Christ, you don't have a verbal inspiration. You have no hope. You have no regeneration, no sanctification, no justification, no reconciliation. If you don't have an incarnate Christ, we would all be lost and without hope. So the incarnation is a very important pillar in this book. And there are seven pillars. That's the first pillar. The, 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 the pillar of his incarnation. John chapter 1 through John chapter 1 verse 18. Then you have his presentation. That's when he was presented to the world. Jesus, Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. And everywhere he went, he was presented to the world as the Savior of the world. And you find that in John chapter 1, verse 15, to John chapter 4, verse 54. Then you enter into another segment called the Confrontation. And we have been in that for quite a period of time. The Confrontation begins in John chapter 5 and ends in John chapter 12, verse 50. What is the Confrontation? After Jesus Christ was presented to the world, the world was very much... Uh, agitated by who he said he was. They said, where did you come from? Who's your dad? Remember we talked about that. And what is your ministry? And how can you say you're the son of God? We know who you are. You're the son of a illegitimate brother. We know who you are. And all the time, Jesus defended who he was and where he came from. If when you look at the confrontation, you'll also find in that segment of Scripture, John chapter 5 to John chapter 12, verse 50, you'll find five debates, very fiery debates, that occurred between Jesus and his critics. And you'll also find five reactions in those debates. Then we entered into a segment called the instruction. And that's where we are right now, John chapter 13 to John chapter 16. Is that important? Yeah, it's important. What is he instructing? He is instructing his disciples as to the fact that he is the that he is about to be betrayed. He is instructing his disciples as to his departure, as to the fact that he's going to heaven, about the coming of the Holy Spirit, and about their responsibility for service. And then we enter into another section which we haven't got into yet, and that's called the intercession. And then there's the crucifixion. And then there's the resurrection. So these seven pillars 
present this Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. Why do we study the Gospel of John? Because the Gospel of John presents Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. His purpose was to bring the light of life to mankind. His purpose was to bring redemption for all. If you remember, he said on one occasion that he was the bread of life. He said that he was the light of the world. He said that he was the door, that he was the good shepherd, that he was the resurrection and the life, that he was the way, the truth, and the life. The whole purpose of this book is to bring fallen sinners to Jesus Christ. That's what the gospel is. The gospel is the good news. Luke chapter 5 verse 32 says, I came not to call the righteous to repentance, but I came to call sinners to repentance. But what about you and I this morning? What about those of us this morning who have made our way to the mourner's bench? Made our way to the inquiry room? Made our way to the pew upon our bended knee and someone took the Word of God and opened the Word of God and it introduced us to Jesus Christ. Showed us that we were a sinner. Showed us that He is the Savior. Showed us that we need to call out to Him with our mouth and say, Lord, forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart and be my Savior. What is this book to you and I? This book is a call to repentance to the lost. Clear and simple. We sing that. John chapter 20. And verse 31, we just read it just a few moments ago. But what is this book to you and I who know the Lord? This book is a call to duty. This book is a call to duty. Well, listen. When you enter into the military service, you enter in because there's a call to duty. Some are placed in harm's way. We talked about that a little bit Wednesday night. And some are placed in a position of support. They might be the mess hall sergeant. The fattest guy in the barracks. <laughs> or they might be the supply sergeant. The next to the fattest guy in the barracks. <laughs> but it's a call to duty. And when you look at the gospel of John, child of God, believer in Jesus Christ, church, we have a call to duty. <laughs> Jesus said in John chapter 13, verse 34, here's our call to duty. A new commandment I give unto you that you love one another as I have loved you. He said in verse 35, by this shall all men know you are my disciples if you have love one for another. True love will manifest itself. I've told you this before about Jose. <coughs> Jose was asked, and this appeared I believe on the Ed Sullivan show a long time ago. That just showed you how old I had, some of you don't even know what Ed Sullivan is. But uh, it was a variety show that those of you don't know. But this gentleman appeared on Ed Sullivan and he was kind of a comic comedian and they asked him and talked to him and he was talking about his love and how much he was in love with his sweetheart and how he would climb the highest mountain for his sweetheart. How he would swim across the deepest ocean for his sweetheart. How he would walk across the driest desert for his sweetheart. <laughs> and then he asked him, well, when will you see your sweetheart next? He said, tonight, if it don't rain. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't true love, now, was it? And you know what, folks, today? That's a little bit the way it is with the church. We have great verbal proclamation, but when push comes to shove, we haven't heard the call of duty. <coughs> the call of duty is never true. The call of duty sometimes calls for real commitment. The Bible says, the love of Christ, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 and 15, the love of Christ constraineth us. If you look up the word constraineth, you know what it means? It means the love of Christ arrests us. We have been arrested by the power of the gospel. We have been called to duty by the power of the gospel to serve yes, Man, Jesus God. Christ. Man. The love of Christ constraints. Oh listen, the flesh will compel you. You have to deal with that every day. The world will compel you. But if you have been arrested by Jesus Christ, as was the Apostle Paul, because he said, I am a servant of Jesus Christ. We've been studying the book of Jude. On Wednesday night, Jude said, a servant of Jesus Christ. What is he saying? He's saying, I have been arrested by the power of the gospel. I have heard the call to duty. 
because of the gospel upon my heart and life. For the last two weeks, we've been in the Gospel of John, verse 13, or chapter 13, which is the instruction phrase, phase of Christ's ministry. Christ is instructing His disciples. They're going to be the ones that are going to have to carry on in His absence. When we come to church in the morning to worship the Lord, we come here to be uplifted. We come here to, to worship the Lord. We come here to learn how to better serve Him. Because we know that one day, one day, we're going to hear the call to duty. Someone's going to come to us and say to us, will you take this Sunday school call? Will you work here in this particular department? Will you help out here? And we are in the process of learning, and that the learning begins in Sunday school. And by the way, if you haven't been to Sunday school, we invite you to come to Sunday school. Amen. You'll have a great time in Sunday school. If you haven't made it a point to get up and be here at 9.30, make it a point to get up and be here at 9.30. Amen. We'll have a great, great time. And as we study the Word, that carries over into our worship service. Listen, with the passing of time, a generation comes and a generation goes. I got some pictures to hold that was given to us of some of you when you were many years back. Things change, don't they? With all of us. Listen, there's a generation coming on the scene and there's a generation leaving the scene. What are we to do? The generation that's leaving the scene needs to be trained in the generation that's coming on the scene. The Apostle Paul trained Timothy. Jesus trained his disciples. Elijah trained Elisha. When we come here to John chapter 14, probably one of the most recognized passages in the Word of God, particularly the first six verses of John chapter 14, John chapter 14 deals with Jesus Christ, the mighty constant. And what we have here in this particular passage of Scripture, we have a call to duty to the church, to the believer in Jesus Christ. What does he say in John chapter 14 verse 1? He says, Let not your heart be troubled. I want you to know this morning that the call to duty is never easy. It's never easy. There are soldiers that can tell you stories of the call to duty and it's never easy. Why would the disciples' heart be troubled? Why would Jesus say this to the disciples as he gathered them around him? He said, let not your heart be troubled. Why would he say that? Well, he's just shared with them of his departure. He had just told them that he is going to heaven and they can't come with him at this time. He has just shared with them of his betrayal. He's just told Peter that he's going to deny him. You know, one of the most dreaded diseases in this world today is heart trouble. People in the prime of life can be cut down with heart trouble. With a heart attack. And heart trouble, heart disease, is generally no respecter of persons. You can be young or you can be old. We just seen here just recently of a young guy, I think he was in the state of Michigan, I'm not sure, went in for a layup, made the winning basket for his team, and shortly thereafter he died. Didn't know it. He had some heart situations. Heart trouble. But Jesus is not talking about the heart trouble of the physical body. He's talking about the heart trouble of the spiritual life. The spiritual heart in How many this morning whose heart is broken? Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. Why do we have broken heart? Why do we have a burdened heart? A burdened heart can come because of a failed marriage. A burdened heart can come because of a wayward child. Maybe you've never experienced it. Maybe you've never experienced having a wayward child. Sometimes God allows us to go through that trial, that test in our life. A lot of people see it as all cut and dry. You bring them to church, you bring them to Sunday school, you set them under the teaching and preaching of the Word of God, you have a devotional time, they ought to grow up, act right, talk right, smell right, do right. Sometimes they don't always do that. Because they're a free moral agent. They can do what they want to do sometimes. They will be held accountable for what they do. Maybe here this morning, a parent with a broken heart. 
because of a wayward child. Maybe your heart is heavy this morning because of a lost child. Yeah, boy, there's a lot of that game coming. Maybe your heart is heavy because of sickness, death. Maybe because of a backslide situation. Maybe a spouse or, or a child. Maybe you have a child or a husband or a wife outside the ark of safety. Maybe you're caring for a loved one and your strength is almost gone. And you don't know what to do. <laughs> Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe also in God, believe also in me. Someone said this, the world is full of the ruins which sin has caused. Had it not been for the original sin, we would not be in the shape we are today. We would not have sickness. We would not have death. We would not have good days and bad days. We would not have tears of sorrow had it not been for the sin. We live in an hour of great, great uncertainty. But I want to tell you something this morning. Your heart might be discouraged. Your heart might be troubled. And the Word of God teaches us that there is hope for the discouraged. He says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. Do you remember on one occasion when Jesus Christ came to his disciples? He came walking on the water. You remember that story? Take your Bible and turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 14. Matthew, chapter 14. Notice what it says in Matthew, chapter 14, and verse 25. It says, In the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. Now, if you go back to verse 24, it says, But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, and tossed with the waves, for the wind was contrary. And so here it was, the fourth watch of the night. Verse 26, And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, for it is I. It is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship and walked on the water to go to Jesus, but he saw that the winds were boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sing, crying and saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, Wherefore dost thou doubt? You know, as we look at this passage of Scripture, we have a tremendous lesson for us this morning. Our heart is going to be burdened from time to time. Our heart is going to be heavy from time to time. time, to time. Our pillow is going to have tears on it from, from time to time as we lay our head upon our pillow at night. What do we need to do? The very thing that Peter did. We need to look unto the Lord. And we need to keep our eyes upon the Lord. We need to keep our eyes upon the Lord because with the Lord there's hope for the hopeless. There's strength for the weak. We need to keep our eyes on the prize that is before us. We need to be reminded that the darkest hour is just before the dawn. If we would study the book of Ephesians, as we've been studying the book of Ephesians in the Pathfinder class, we find that in the book of Ephesians, the Apostle Paul admonished the church in the book of Ephesians not to think and act like the lost world does. Paul goes to great length in the book of Ephesians, particularly in chapter 4, not to admonish the church, not to act and think in the vanity of their minds. It's so easy to look at the world, how the world makes decisions, how the world solves its problems, how the world medicates its broken heart. But as a believer in Jesus Christ, we need to be admonished to look to the Lord. Because it's as we look to the Lord, it's then that our heart will be medicated. It's then that we'll find strength. It's then that we'll find hope. That we'll find encouragement. We're living in a world this morning that's out of control. But we know the one who is in control as a believer in Jesus Christ. If your heart is troubled, then you and I need to lay hold of what the Word of God has to say. I remember reading about George Mueller. George Mueller ran an orphan. George Mueller did everything that he did, he did by faith. He laid hold of the promises of the Word of God, and he claimed those promises, and he held God accountable for those promises. There was one occasion that he sat down at the orphanage with his kids that he had in the orphanage, and they had no milk in the orphanage. George Mueller and his staff prayed that God would supply that particular need. They sat down at the table, the dishes were on the table, 
The food was on the table, but there was no milk on the table. They asked the blessed, they asked God to bless the food, to bless the drink which they were about to receive. And lo and behold, right about that time, there came a knock on the door. That was in the days when they didn't have refrigeration like we have today. There was a knock on the door, and there was a man's truck that broke down like right out in front of his orphanage. Guess what kind of truck it was? It was a milk. He had milk to get rid of. You see, here's a man that learned to lay hold of God. The God that can give water from the rock. The God that can send manna from heaven. The God that can give quail as meat from heaven can supply the need. If God can do that for His children of Israel, will He not do that for His church? Amen. Absolutely. He will do that for His church. He will supply the needs of our life. It will lay hold on it. It will keep our eyes upon it. But when the wind is boisterous, and we begin to look at our surroundings, and we begin to allow our surroundings to influence us in our decision making, sometimes we tend to look down rather than looking up, rather than keeping our eyes upon the prize that is before us. You might look at your life and say, well, my situation is a different situation. Listen, there has never been a situation that is too hard for God. Never been a situation that is too hard for God. The best plan of escape from that which troubles you is to look into Jesus. The best plan of escape is to run to the arms of Jesus. I want us to consider some verses this morning that I believe that are instruction for the troubled heart. Take your Bible and turn with me to the book of Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6. I want us to consider some instruction this morning for the troubled heart. Perhaps this morning your heart is troubled. Perhaps this passage in John chapter 14 tends to be speaking to you, let not your heart be troubled. Your heart is burdened. Your heart is broken. You go to bed at night and you're thinking about something. You just can't let it go. It's depressing you. It's discouraging you. Your faith is growing weak. And it's very easy to look at that situation and say, it's too hard. There is nothing too hard for God. And God in His Word gives us some good instruction that we need to lay hold of. He says in Philippians chapter 4 verse 6, He says, be careful for nothing. What does that mean? That means this. That means that if God is in the boat, not to worry about it. Keep your eyes upon the Lord. We looked at a passage of Scripture on a Sunday night and how the disciples were in the water and they were riding in a boat and the wind and the waves were blowing and the water was coming over the top of the boat and they run to the Lord and they said, Lord, wake up! We're going to perish! Now think about it. God is in the boat. And you're going to perish? What did He say? He said, oh, be a little faith. How many times do we act that way? We say proudly and boldly, I'm a child of the king. Then when adversity comes, we say, we're going to perish. We have been called to duty as a church, as a believer in Jesus Christ. And this call to duty isn't always going to be rosy, isn't always going to be tearless, isn't always going to be without the burdens of life. But in this call to duty, we need to keep our eye upon the one that called us to duty. Amen. Keep our eye upon the one that called us to duty. And he tells us how to persevere in these hours of tests and trials. He said, be careful for nothing. We're not to fret, and that's hard not to do. But we're not to worry, because we know that God is greater than the situation. We're to lay hold of God. What else does he say? He says, by prayer and supplication. What does that mean? That means we pour out our heart to God. We bear our soul before Him. We share what's on our heart. The most intimate thing in the deepest recess of our heart, we pour it out to Him. You say, well, I don't know how to pray. I can't pray like brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so. You know what? Some of the most eloquent prayers that were ever prayed were prayed by children. Yes. Prayed in faith believing. They didn't have a lot of theology. They didn't know a lot of Bible theology. They just knew Jesus saved them. And they knew where to look and who to call upon. You know, it's kind of like a little child. He doesn't know all that you have upon your plate, does he? But he knows when it hurts, who's he call? Mommy! When he needs the car, who does he go to? Daddy! 
He knows where to go to, doesn't he? Or she does. He doesn't understand how that car works. He doesn't understand what's involved to make the home work. But he knows who to go to. And so does that little child. And in childlike faith, he pours out his heart. It doesn't have to be eloquent. He speaks from his heart. But God has placed before his heart. My wife used to teach a Sunday school class in the church here in Bryan. The present pastor right there was a little boy in that class. A little black-headed boy in that class. Every Sunday morning, he would come to church. And when they asked for prayer requests, he would say, pray for my dad. Pray for my dad. Do you realize today his, well, when we left the church, his dad was the chairman of the board of the trustees. His, chat, his dad sat on the building committee board. This dad was a very quiet man, but a very strong man spiritually. You know why? Because of the prayers of a little child. Prayers of faith. Now the Bible says the prayer of supplication. That means we pour out our heart before Him. Take your Bible and turn with me to Psalms chapter 81. I believe we was in this passage of Scripture last Sunday night. Here on Sunday night. If you haven't made the habit of coming on Sunday night, I can encourage you to come. This Sunday night we're going to be talking about the call. You ever get a telephone call? No. You say, well, I'm going to let that phone ring three or four times before I pick it up. Man, I might not even pick it up. <clears throat> Sometimes God dies you know, and He put God on hold. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. But in Psalms chapter 81, we was in this passage, I believe, last Sunday evening. It says this in verse 10. It says, I'm the Lord God who has brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Open thy mouth wide and I will fill it. What's he saying? He said, I'm the God that brought thee out. What did God do for the nation of Israel? He gave them water from the rock. He gave them manna from heaven. He gave them quail. He said, if you have a need, open your mouth wide and I will fill it. He's saying that to us this morning. But listen to what he says in verse 11. But my people would not hearken to my voice, and Israel would none of me. Listen to what it says in verse 12. So I gave them up unto their own hearts must. Sometimes we get to feeling sorry for ourselves and our situation. Sometimes we wonder why it seems like the world's all against them. Would you ever get on your knees before God and say, Lord, help me in this situation? You can sit here and sit there and just Run that over and over and over in your mind, over and over again. Why is it my situation the way it is? Woe is me. And you know what? God sometimes will just allow you to have that mess until you're willing to call out to Him. And that's for deliverance from that situation. Sometimes we need to call out to Him to help us in, in health needs, in financial needs. You remember the story of Naaman? Naaman was told to go and wash in the river. And Naaman said to his servant, he said, you know, that's the dumbest thing in all the world. Go down and dip yourself in that river. And Naaman's servant said to him, he said, well, if the prophet told you to do something hard, would you do it? Naaman said, yeah, I probably would have done it. Then why don't you go down and just do what he said? And so Naaman went down, and he did what the prophet said. He dipped himself seven times. He came up clean. The leprosy was gone. Why? Because he walked in obedience to what the prophet had said. The Word of God says, by be careful for nothing by prayer and supplication. You don't have to carry the weight of your burden. Amen. Amen, sir. Cast your burden upon the Lord. You know one thing you learn to do when you get old? You call for your kids. Amen. <laughs> it's too heavy. I can't lift that heavy. So I call for my sons. When I was here this morning, he can lift it. And I just sit back and relax. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Direct, guide, here, there. Let them spring over here. That's fine with me. That's the way it's supposed to be. That's what God wants you and I to do with our problems and our burdens and our concerns. Man, He's got a whole lot more strength than you got. He's got a whole lot more power than you got. He's got a whole lot more wisdom than you got. Why don't you bring that thing that's besetting you, that's discouraging you, that's causing you to put tears on your pillow? Bring it to Him. By prayer and supplication. And then it says this. It's to be made with thanksgiving. Holy moly. You mean to tell me i got to thank the Lord for this big pimple right in the center of my head and I don't want that pimple? No, no. He wants you to be thankful for everything. Did you ever stop to think how God sometimes allows tests, 
to come into our lives. And in those tests and in those trials, He teaches us what we never ever would have learned had it not been for that test. Had it not been for that wayward child. God has taught you more theology. Taught you more about His sustaining grace. His goodness. You would have never learned if your child was 100% perfect. And it's through that that you learn to have what Jesus said in John chapter 13. A new commandment I give unto you that you love one another. You learn to love other people as they're going through the storm rather than sit back stand like the old Pharisees. Like, thank you. It didn't happen to my home. It didn't happen to me. If you just lived like I did, went to Bethlehem Christian Union, showed up at Sunday school every Sunday morning, gave your tithe to the Lord, and was there for church and there for Sunday night, there for Wednesday night, none of those problems would ever happen to you. But they happen to you because you're a terrible sinner. There's a lot of Pharisees like that, aren't there? Listen, you can dot all your I's and cross all your T's. Sometimes there comes trials and storms. But those trials and storms are permitted by a sovereign God for the purpose of teaching His children more about Himself. Yes, Revealing his, his glory and His power to them. That they might go on and help others who are going through the storms of life. The Bible says we know all things work together for good to them who love the Lord, to them who have been called according to His purpose. Philippians 4, 7 says, And the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and mind through Christ Jesus. We're running out of time this morning. But I'm going to keep on going. So if you've got to go home and the beans are burned, you go ahead and go on home. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. I want to give you another verse of Scripture. This addresses that very same thing. Matthew chapter 11 verse 28 says this. It says, Come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You know what rest is? Rest is not the absence of labor. Rest is not the absence of hardship and suffering and even tears. Rest is the absence of guilt. Is the absence of anxiety. Rest is hope and assurance and peace and joy. And you can't find that until you draw the water out of the well of salvation. Until you have surrendered your will to His will and walk in obedience. And it's then that you'll begin to discover that rest in the midst of the storms of life. Psalms 55 verse 22 says, Cast thy burden upon the Lord and He shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. God doesn't necessarily take the burden away, but He gives you strength to carry the burden. Yes. God doesn't remove the mountain, but He gives you strength to climb the mountain. Now that's what God wants to do, and that's what God will do in our hearts and lives. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. Why is there hope for the hopeless? Verse 1 of John chapter 14 says this, Believe also in me, unless you trust in Jesus Christ, there will never be hope. If you're troubled this morning, verse 2 says, rest in this promise. He says, in my Father's house of many mansions, if it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. It's called home. If you're troubled this morning, he says in verse 3, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. Soldiers, are wounded on the battlefield from time to time. And many stories have been told of their buddies who have come together. I want you to know that Jesus Christ is coming back again for His church. Amen. We have been called to duty. You guys remember when you were in the service? I remember one occasion, many occasions, but one particular occasion. <laughs> The officer of the day walked into the barracks. And in our barracks, the old barracks, we walked in, and there was, the, there was a latrine right over here. And you know what happens when the officer of the day walks in again? What happens? Call him to attention. Call him to attention. Heads up! Everybody stand. Not the prettiest sight in the latrine. <laughs> when the officer of the day walks by the latrine, you kind of know where I'm going, don't you? You know what he says? He says, carry on. And he keeps on going. <laughs> carry on. Jesus Christ.
Christ is saying to you and I as the church, we have been called to duty. And there will be tears and there will be suffering and there will be hardship. He says, carry on, my child. Why? Luke chapter 21 verse 28 says, And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your head for your redemption. Draw on that. If you're troubled this morning and don't know the way, Jesus said in verse 6, I am the way. Someone said this, A man on his knees before God can stand before anyone or anything. I don't know what's troubling your heart this morning, but I know that God that can solve that problem. Yeah. That God can help you to carry that burden. I didn't say necessarily take it away. But unless we open our mouth wide, unless we bring our petition before Him, unless we come to Him, then He will give us many times what we don't ask for. Allow us to live in that particular predicament that we're in. A man who advances on his knees can stand before anyone. I don't know what's on your heart this morning, but perhaps God's been dealing with you. Perhaps your heart is heavy. Done what you want. Speaks to that very thing, but not your heart is troubled. If your heart is troubled, then bring your burden to the Lord. Your heart is troubled because you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And you need to open up your heart and receive it as you say. Whatever that need is, be willing to come to Him. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for the power you present. And we pray, Father, should there be those in our congregation this morning that have a need of making a decision for Jesus Christ, that are carrying a heavy load, that need to cast that burden before your throne. I pray that the Holy Spirit this morning will give great liberty for your people to go to Jesus. To keep their eyes upon Him by coming to Him, by surrendering to His will, and bring their petition before His throne. For we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Take the hymnals for you and turn the page. Even the wind and the wind.